And uh, on to our next uh, speakers. Okay, we have two speakers for for this next presentation. Geospatial services for all, servers inclusive approach to service design. This will be presented by Catherine Casey, the knowledge management lead, and uh, Jose Leandro R. Fernandez, user engagement lead for Server Amazonia. Catherine Casey is the knowledge management lead and uh, is a knowledge management professional skilled in driving knowledge transfer through the use of data and collaboration. She has over 13 years of experience managing knowledge management, communications, and learning initiatives in Central Asia, Eastern Europe, North America, and Sub-Saharan Africa for donors, private companies, and nonprofits, and is passionate about supporting international science collaboration. Her colleague, who will present uh, halfway through the presentation, will be Mr. Fernandez, is the user engagement lead of Servier Amazonia. He is an experienced international development professional who has worked on major international programs funded by USAID, IDB, BID, and UN, coordinating projects and providing services in the areas of economic development, urban sustainability, and environmental management. So everyone, please uh, give a warm welcome to our speakers. Uh, go ahead, Catherine, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. I believe I shared my screen. Oh, there we go. No. Oh, here we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, welcome to Geospatial Services for All, Servier's inclusive approach to service design. Uh, my name is Catherine Casey, Knowledge Management Lead for Servier, and I'm presenting today with Jose Leandro Fernandez, a user engagement lead with Servier Amazonia. Over the next 30 minutes, we'd like to share with you how Servier builds inclusive spaces when does developing geospatial services uh, in, uh, to ensure that the services develop benefit all of society. So first, a little bit about Servier. Uh, Servier is a joint initiative of USAID and NASA that partners with countries in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. Uh, to tackle the impacts of climate change by using satellite data uh, to monitor food security, water disasters, land use, and air quality. Here you can see uh, where we work, uh, partnering with uh, leading applied science institutes to create severe hubs, uh, as well as with NASA scientists and development colleagues. Uh, now to uh, discuss service design. Uh, we're trying, like many of you, to bridge the gap between the best science and expertise available and using that to make a difference in the world. So this is the approach that we started with, uh, basically designing the solution first and passing it over or maybe throwing it over the fence to the end user. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this led to a graveyard of geospatial tools. Um, tools weren't updated, they didn't work right, uh, basically they weren't sustainable. So we sh made a shift and we reoriented ourselves around an approach that engaged the end users from the very beginning. It's an approach we call the severe service planning approach and it's articulated in our service planning toolkit. So with Servier, we're striving to make a development impact that reaches all communities. And we do this by developing services uh, that use geospatial data to monitor local challenges related to climate change. Uh, but before we can develop a service, we must understand the development challenge itself or the need in the regions where we work. And to do that, we need to establish a working relationship with potential users of the service and start engaging them as active co-developers. We also need to identify and engage the full spectrum of stakeholders, future users, complementary initiatives. And then we need a strong design to put our plans into action and clear goals for our service and a way to measure impact. So we developed this service planning toolkit to outline our approach to all of these steps. And it's what Servier has used to develop more than 40 services at our five hubs, engaging hundreds of colleagues and thousands of stakeholders. The toolkit has four tools that are designed to be used in an iterative way 
And by that, I mean, you can revisit different stages of service planning to refine the approach, and that's expected and encouraged. I will now walk through the four stages of service planning, highlight what the toolkit includes to support the application of this approach, and share some insights from our first major update to the toolkit. It's our hope that sharing this approach with you will give you some ideas uh, for supporting your current work or future work to make it more responsive to local needs and more inclusive of users, as well as the communities impacted. The first stage of service planning is consultation and needs assessment. At this stage, we seek to identify the co-development challenge, or sorry, the development challenge that the service will address, as well as the key actors and need, uh, that need to be involved to co-develop the service with us. So at this stage, we're asking questions such as, who are the key stakeholders and how are they currently making decisions? What information are stakeholders using? Where are there gaps in information or capacity? And how can we build on or complement other activities? Uh, through consultation needs assessment activities, we establish the key relationships that will be maintained throughout service design and delivery. By engaging the end users from the beginning, we ensure that the products we develop meet a clearly expressed need and that we have partners to work with when the products under the service are ready for use. So we're thinking about sustainability from the very start. Our service planning toolkit includes ideas on consultation approaches, such as workshops, key influencer meetings, surveys, and focus groups, as well as workshop resources. So how to conduct a consultative workshop with a sample agenda, group work exercises on problem identification and prioritization, and report templates for capturing discussions. So once we understand the need and the actors, we use stakeholder mapping to make sense of the complex landscape of stakeholders, uh, how they work, what their decision-making processes are, and to identify where SEVERE fits into the process. To support stakeholder mapping, the toolkit includes tips for mapping in a workshop setting and guidance on visualizing stakeholder roles and responsibilities. Now that we know our actors understand how they work together and how decisions are made, we enter into service design. So the goal for this phase is to unite our hub teams and users in a collaborative process to outline the service design, development, and implementation. At this stage, we ask questions such as, who's the service for? which stakeholders will be engaged, what decisions will it inform, and how will information be delivered. To support service design, the toolkit includes a service concept template that articulates the service vision and how it leads to impact, and three definition documents that specify the technical details and other activities related to various components of a service, so including the products, data management, and training or capacity building activities. In order to understand the impact of our service and to learn through implementation, we use monitoring, evaluation, and learning. At, at this stage of, stage of service planning, we create, collect, and report on relevant performance indicators and nurture a culture of asking challenging questions and having the evidence to support responses. This stage of service planning focuses on a, developing a theory of change. So a theory of change maps out in detail how activities and interventions lead to impact. It's both a process and a product. It's a process in that it is a collaborative exercise to systematically think through how to achieve a desired change. And it's also a product in that it results in a visual representation of the steps and the logic behind them to achieve change. So our toolkit um, uh, supports the development of theories of change uh, by including uh, potential templates uh, as guidance on selecting indicators. Severe has been implementing this approach since 2017, but over time, our network has struggled to make the design process more inclusive uh, to women and other communities, and to have a concrete way to make sure that the needs of people differentiated by their gender, age, class, minority status, were benefiting equally. In order for geospatial services to truly address development challenges, the distinct issues facing women and other communities that contribute to their vulnerability uh, and or resilience to climate extremes need to be understood and addressed. So we spent the pandemic collecting case studies of how we and our partners have achieved inclusive services, and we reviewed the toolkit to see where we could make the guidance more intentionally inclusive by adding approaches, examples, and adjusting language and template prompts. Uh, we learned that there are lots of ways to be inclusive in the service planning process. 
Firstly, we have many opportunities to engage women as stakeholders and users. We can establish communities of practice for women working in geospatial. We can organize women-only trainings to support, uh, to create a supportive space for women to gain new skills. We can partner with an organization that brings sex desegregated data to complement our own. And we can be proactive or even retroactive about inclusion at the consultation and needs assessment and stakeholder mapping phases. Second, we can use the iterative nature of service planning to support more inclusive services. The cyclical nature of service planning provides reoccurring opportunities to assess the varied impact of a service based uh, on gender and representation of women in, in a co-design process. Third, we have opportunities to better understand the development challenges of women and other communities. We can use surveys to understand varied impacts or varied modes of access to technology and ways of receiving information. We can use separate focus groups for men and women to ensure that all voices are heard. We can use sex desegregated data and we can and should consider stakeholder intersectionality and how that contributes to vulnerability. Finally, we will continue learning through implementation. The majority of severe services to date address gender during implementation, not during service design. In light of this, conducting a gender analysis can be useful and involving gender advisors at all stages of service planning is considered an advantage. And not knowing the answer, but asking the question can be an important, important first step to developing inclusive services. So we're pleased to share the results of this work with the Phosphor-G community. Uh, both the updated service planning toolkit and our collection of case studies are available on severeglobal.net. We hope that other groups can learn along with Severe and we welcome further conversations about inclusive services. And now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague who's going to give an example of service planning in action. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, um, uh, can, can you manage the presentation for me as well? Yes. Yes, I can. Yeah, so, um, so uh, hello to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I am José Leandro Fernández, uh, Servi Amazonia User Engagement Lead. I work for um, the Alliance of Bioverse International and the International Center of Tropical Agriculture. Um, and I'm here to, uh, to present a bit of our, our experience uh, in the Servi Amazonia Consortium. Uh, related specifically to the consultation and needs assessment in action. Uh, we are considered for our presentation a thematic area uh, uh, for the land cover and land use change and ecosystem. And the service that we will adopt as a reference is the ecosystem service modeling in the Amazon's forest agriculture interface. Uh, one prior information um, just to let you know, uh, the Servir Amazonia uh, hub is the youngest uh, uh, hub uh, of Servir Global. Uh, it's led by uh, uh, CIET, uh, uh, the, 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 the former CIET, and now is the Alliance of Bioverse International and the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, along with other institutions uh, from the region. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the Instituto de Manejo e Certificação Florestal e Agrícola, Ima Flora from Brazil, um, um, the Association para la Conservación de la Cuenca Amazonica, ACA uh, for Peru, uh, Fundación Ecociencia for Ecuador, and the private company Spatial Informatics Group based in California, the US, specifically for the technical and scientific purpose. Um, and other uh, specificities uh, uh, that's part of the Severe Service Planning Toolkit, and we adopted absolutely in Severe Amazonia Consortium, is uh, the open source uh, mechanism along with all the services we co develop with co implemented in the region, as well as uh, the demand driven process in terms of um, identifying needs and addressing these needs together with the institutions that we co-developed services. The next, please. Yes, so um, basically uh, the, the, the presentation here will concentrate in these uh, questions and themes. So how does the consultation process and identification of needs with users take place? 
why is such a process important for services co-development and what are the drivers for the services uh, sustainability? Next, please. So um, basically for Servio Amazonia, uh, the engagement activities uh, through user consultation and needs assessment are very important and prior to the development of sustainable process for the co-development of services. Uh, without engagement, it's very difficult to advance in a, an organized way in the development of services along with uh, key institutions uh, in the region. So basically we come from a user needs assessment, uh, conducting workshop and conducting many other uh, instrumental research applications goes to the prioritization of service ideas and then we target the engagement as we uh, 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 get in detail in the next slides. The next please. So basically this uh, um, is the Servia Amazonia current services. So um, it's quite difficult to, to, to read here, but um, we are uh, co-developing six services in Brazil, four services in Peru, two services in Ecuador, two services in Colombia, and one service in Guyana. So just to stress here, we have just uh, launched a service um, uh, last week in Brazil, no as Terra on track, led by Ima Flora, along with uh, institutions, uh, representatives from the Calia Norte region in the, the Brazilian order, northern of the Brazilian Amazon. And Terra on track uh, aims to increase the protection of force managed by community-based initiatives in the Brazilian Amazon. And it, it, it reunites or organize many other data sets provided by INPE Brazil and provided by, by NASA and by Servir Global. Another service that we uh, launched and, and, and we are in the stay, in delivery stage uh, uh, along with ACA Peru is the HAMI, the monitoring of gold mining in the Peruvian Amazon. So it's a really important uh, 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 service in order to produce near real-time information on deforestation and activity due to mining uh, exploitation in the southern uh, Peruvian Amazon, specifically in the Madre Deus region. And these services is a quite innovative one uh, because we use uh, 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 besides of Landsat uh, uh, 8 as a satellite data, uh, 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 we use Sentinel-1 from uh, ESA in order to provide uh, synthetic aperture hardware technologies uh, uh, for the specific of the, the running of the algorithms of this service. So coming to uh, 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 the presentation, the next one. So here is the service in practice. So the service ecosystem uh, uh, services modeling in the Amazon Forest Agricultural Interface is the one we are considering as a reference for this presentation. And this service is co-developed with the Brazilian institutions like Embrapa, uh, Amazonia Oriental Unit based in Belém, Pará, and the Peruvian uh, institutions like CERNAMP and Alianza Cacao. Uh, the next slide, please. So what are the consultation and needs assessment in practice about? So um, at the service level, so basically all, as mentioned by Catherine, all the severe hubs use the severe service planning toolkit. So within the scope of the service, uh, we use it as an example in this presentation, we carry out a user needs assessment workshop for the validation of the rapid stock taking, as well as for the arrival of the NASA Applying Science Team Initiative. In this case, uh, led by Dr. Nayara Pinto from NASA JPL, which scientifically guided the engagement with key users and co-implementers. So the final goal of the consultation workshop is to get up with a list of service needs and service ideas elaborated in a participative way 
It means that including IPOs, institutions, uh, indigenous people organizations, representatives, and representatives of forest dependent communities. So besides this list of service ideas, the user needs assessment workshop is important to better understand the GIT infrastructure in each country, as well as to identify the needs of user organizations and the gaps in planning and addressing public policies for each thematic area of the program. So um, basically we have uh, uh, established a user needs assessment workshop in Bogota, Colombia, in Lima, Peru, in Quito, Ecuador, and Brasilia, uh, the federal district in Brazil. Uh, we, we could not have the, the, the opportunity yet to establish this workshop in Guyana, um, and neither in Suriname, given the, 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 the pandemic purpose. So um, the next slide, please. So uh, with the country list of service ideas in hand, uh, Servio Amazonia Hub proceeds with the prioritization of service ideas according to these criteria that we are seeing here um, with this slide. Uh, the prioritization of service uh, ideas has been given jointly with the ASTs and the technical teams of the different key stakeholders of the identified services. In the case of the service example, we adopted here Embrapa Brazil and Minam Peru, the, the, the environmental minister of Peru, were invited to participate in this prioritization of services. The next, please. So in the case of the service uh, uh, adopted as an example here, we spoke with several Embrapa units, Aliança Cacau, among others, to present the NASA EST initiative led by Nayara Pinto, and the focus was to understand the needs and agreeing on the next formalization steps, which can take months to years, depending on the service and key organizations. For the example adopted here, it was more or less a quick process, given uh, the previous uh, understanding and research uh, between uh, Nayara Pinto that's a Brazilian uh, uh, scientist, uh, uh, and uh, Adriano Venturieri, that at the time was uh, uh, heading uh, the Amazonia Oriental unit of Embrapa. Uh, and in a very quick way, we agreed in terms of a work plan that subsidized the memorandum of understanding. And then we, we start to, to, to establish, uh, to implement the activities foreseen for, uh, by the work plan. So the next slide, please. So then after this uh, uh, identification, we go to the formalization process that we, we're gonna get to explain here a little bit, and especially why this formalization is really important for us in terms of uh, creating some commit, commit, commitment with co-implementary institutions, and, uh, uh, and more specifically, the potential sustainability of the services through a second version of these, 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 these services, adapting to new technologies, and more important, adapting to new potential needs uh, uh, and new uh, 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 partners that come up into the process, uh, through the process of socialization of the service. So after uh, all these explanations, we went to a formalization of partnership with, for the co-development service. So towards uh, to inst institutionalization of services and products. So the memorandum of understanding give institutional support and commitment to these technical activities. There is also a certain level of transparency, accountability and empowerment that is obtaining through the visibility that is given to the sign of MOU, thanks to the support of communication area of Serbia Amazonia. So these MOUs 
uh, will somehow waterproof us against the institutional and political change uh, of our main partners. In this sense, we consider that we are working with a long-term vision. So in this context, the co-development of process is only structured once the co-implementing organizations understanding their role in the service conceptual note or work plan. The formalization of partnership through the signing of MOUs generating a commitment to the co-development and co-deliver of services. However, for the sustainability of services, a step forward is needed. That is, it is necessary with the co-implementing organizations to appropriate the services and the scientific ideas behind it, in, a, in addition to a robust plan for the socialization and dissemination of the service through of training sessions toward to the use of the service with users, uh, users of users, beneficiaries, and decision makers who see themselves identify with the functionalities or features of the service. So basically, this is a presentation that I reserve for this time here. I'm happy to provide the further information uh, related to our process here in Serbia Amazonia, as well as for uh, a broader questions that is related to our hub. So thank you very much for your time and interest. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Jose and Catherine, um, for, the, for the really great presentation. And we also took the liberty of uh, adding uh, Tony Panella to the, to the screen as well, in case he'd like to contribute. I know we only have uh, three minutes. Um, we do have five questions, and maybe you know, we can pick some of the, I guess, the, 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 the you know, heavier ones. Um, and so... Um, I think this one is for Catherine. Uh, one is, you know, you spoke about, you know, how the how the service planning process has has changed, how it's more inclusive. And so the question is, have you noticed any differences in outcomes um, between, you know, the the needs assessments which were more inclusive versus, you know, needs assessments um, that were done before you adopted the the more inclusive um, process? And then the related, there's a related question. And it has to do with um, whether you, Catherine, could speak a little bit as well about, um, you know, the differences with what you presented in terms of, you know, the service approach versus, you know, one-off types of, of products. And so um, I guess I'll stop and, and let you answer, Catherine. Sure, thanks. Those are uh, really interesting questions. Um, to respond to the first one about any changes or any results that we're seeing, particularly among the, the early stages of service design, I think the real difference is that um, we've kind of built our own capacity within Servier to start thinking through these issues about when there are targeted opportunities to be more inclusive and to be more intentionally inclusive. So it used to be something that used to be the domain of the gender advisors or the gender points of contact, um, people that might be engaged, you know, not on, in every service. And now we see more service teams thinking through, oh, you know, we're at this consultative moment. Do we are we reflecting the community that we want to serve in the room that we're doing the consultations in? And I think that's really um, amazing difference. Our services take years to develop and implement. So I think it's going to take us a little bit longer to see, um, you know, see differences, particularly in, in service design. But I, I would say that that's been a big change in, um, in our own team and awareness. Um, and then as, as opposed, um, thinking about kind of one-off products versus, um, you know, full services and like the difference in approaches there, uh, I, I always encourage our, 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 within our own network to think um, holistically about what they create. So, you know, it might seem as a one-off product, but um, who is it intended for? And if you intend for someone to use it, that's not just yourself, you, they should probably be part of the, the uh, co-development process in some capacity. Um, you know, otherwise you're going to end up with the, the slide that I showed of creating the, the tool and tossing it over the fence and hoping someone catches it. You know, if it's your baby, if it's, if it's what you're creating, um, you know, bring others into the conversation so that they're more likely to use it and have it be sustained. 
Thank you so much, Catherine. And um, maybe we could ask, we could ask just one more question since I do know that we are uh, at time for Jimenez presentation. And so for Jose, um, you know, you spoke about Severa Amazonia, and you know, we're at Phosphor G where we're talking about open technology. Can you speak a little bit about how uh, Severa Amazonia is utilizing open technology, open science, and whether or not the the algorithms you're developing are you know going to be available to the community? And then we can pass it to back to Francis. Thank you, Jose. Okay, thank you, Emil. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, through Servir Amazonia, um, we we use a lot the Google Earth engine as a basically a platform not only to co-develop it the the first stage of services uh, uh, along with co-implementers, but also for initiating the, the 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 training sessions in terms of raise awareness and transfer capability to. Uh, uh, especially those uh, using institution uh, who does not have a, a, a tremendous capacity or a huge capacity in GIS. So um, uh, the open source uh, uh, mechanism uh, we use in Survey Amazonia is too co related as well to uh, the collective Earth online platform. Uh, through Server Global, that is a platform uh, uh, constructed uh, along with a FAO, um, and 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 it is a is a is a app app based web web based, based uh, platform that you you can add uh, the co, co implementers or co users can adapt their specific data sets into this platform in order to generate an additional or complementary analysis. And results in terms of what their their, their intent to running uh, uh, in, in their uh, specific purpose. So basically, right now um, um, in Severe Amazonia, we are creating uh, like um, uh, an open source platform that uh, uh, put together in our organizational manner uh, all types of data sets and platforms and sensors that we are using. And, and that is, is open for all the society in terms of uh, accelerating and, and, and facilitated access of anybody, of the users, uh, uh, independently that is, is part of the six countries that Silver Amazonia works in order to facilitate their access and, and, and being together with Silver Amazonia for the sustainability of our services. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose, and turning it back over to Francis. So thank you. Uh, thank you both, Catherine and Jose.